So in the last question, we look at how viscous forces can arise between successive layers of fluid as one side of the fluid is forced to move at a certain speed, but then the other side of the fluid is held fixed. Sort of like a deck of cards, it smoothly transitions. And all those forces between the different layers slows down and affects the flow. Another place where viscous forces is important, but with totally different geometry, is inside a tube. So in this case, a blood vessel. So inside the tube here, if you look at the side of the tube, right against the wall, you have V equals zero on all sides. So not just top and bottom, but all the way around, right? But then in the middle, you're going to have some movement. And then again, it, the speed you can look at as smoothly transitioning between the different layers. Or you can think of it as concentric rings of different speed. Being a different geometry, when you get a different model, resulting in a different result that we'll, we'll be applying. Again, we're focusing on applying these results, not so much deriving it. So given all the viscous forces, you're still going to have the same amount of flow in terms of volume as you move through. But because you have all this friction force you have to overcome now, unlike when we assume this kind of friction away in Bernoulli's, we're going to actually get a pressure drop because we need to have a higher pressure in the back to push the fluid forward while still overcoming all this viscous force that works against us. And the result that we have is this. This R here don't stand for radius, it stands for resistance, where R depends on geometry. And for a circular tube, relates to the fourth power of the radius. So then in this case, we're given two situations and we're trying to compare and find out the ratio between the two different radiuses. And it's just a matter of applying all these numbers then. So what we know is that my volume flow rate, Q here, when it's clot, it's only 10% of when it's completely open. We also know that the pressure drop, this P2 minus P1 thing, when it's clotted, is 1.2 times of that when it's open, because it's 20% more. So when you get a more constricted tube, not only does your flow rate go down, you're going to have to lose more pressure as you move along. Those are easy to measure, but the thing we actually probably care about is how much smaller the tube is as a result of all the things we measure. And that's where this physical model comes in. So from this, we can say that that is true. And similarly for the first case, we can expand that as well. When you have fraction of fraction, the denominator gets switched on top. And a bunch of these things do cancel out because both of them still are dealing with blood, and you're talking about the same length in the tube. Pi goes away. And additionally, you can sub this into here, so you know that that's... So we can cancel that out as well. Oh, whoops, I forgot the point one here. So then we can recollect our terms. So we have the fourth root, or you can raise it to the power of 1 over 4, if that's easier on your calculator, to get the ratio between my two radii. So I can find out that the clot has reduced the radius to 54% of the original, which is a significant thing, right? Even if you're only reducing it to 54%, the flow rate is all the way down to 10% because of the fourth power that we're dealing with here. So this is one case where a properly derived physical model can help us relate variables that we can measure easily to variables that we're actually more interested in, in this case, the radius, which is making use of this line that describes what happens when you have a flow where viscous forces is significant within 
a circular tube. With one more additional assumption that we'll talk about in the next video.